thank you for joining us on our journey to better understand innovation and product strategy. My name is Jonathan Edwards and joining me as always, my co-hosts Jan Vermouth and Scott Burleson. Our guests today are, in my opinion, some of the most exciting voices in the innovation space. Many thinkers have questions, questioned the purely analytic approach to innovation, which I personally am naturally drawn to, but I often find them unconvincing. Not so with today's guests. Their ideas on creativity and innovation are a breath of fresh air and truly thought provoking. And most importantly, they've managed the non-trivial feat of weaving them together in a coherent whole. Our guests today are Ian Kerr and Jason Frasca from Emergent Futures Lab, a strategic innovation consulting firm focused on radical innovation. Ian and Jason founded the Emergent Futures Lab in 2018 as a platform for rethinking, uh, create for the rethinking of creativity, invention, and change. They have developed a number of new tools, including the innovation design approach, which we will be talking about today. Ian Kerr is a designer working at the intersection of creativity, ecology, and emergent systems. He's a co-director of the Mix Lab at Montclair State University with, within the Feliciano Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. He's a co-founder of Spurs, an award-winning creative design consultancy that focuses on social, ecological, and ethical transformation. And he regularly works as a consultant, lecturer, and workshop leader on creativity, innovation, and design has done so for institutions such as MIT, Harvard, Columbia University, Parsons, Yale, and others. He formerly studied philosophy and architecture, but his deep immersion in the wilderness around Vancouver, where he grew up, spawned many interests that have since expanded to cover a wide range of fields, including ecology, complexity science, and evolutionary theory. As you will see, these are major influences on his work. His cross-disciplinary approach brings a unique perspective to issues of social innovation, design, and entrepreneurship. And for the last 15 years, he has been actively focusing on developing and testing new models of creativity. Jason Frasca is a native New Yorker and an entrepreneurial business executive, marketing, and sales professional, who has worked with Fortune 500 and nationally recognized clients in many diverse sectors of the economy. He cut his teeth at Boardroom Reports, a business newsletter to executives, where he learned direct response marketing from several legends in the field. With Ian, he is also a co-director of the Mix Lab at Montclair State University, where he teaches innovation, entrepreneurship, sustainability, marketing, and provides mentoring to startups. His research re revolves around disruptive innovation models and frameworks for entrepreneurship, and uses 3D printing as a mechanism to demonstrate and teach these methods and approaches. Jason puts people, the planet, and meaningful innovation at the heart of his approach, and on almost any given day, he can be found collaborating with colleagues, deconstructing complex problems, and providing a systems design approach to the collective invention of new possibilities. Wow, impressive um, profiles we have here today. So. Uh, Ian and Jason, welcome to the uh, Product Quest podcast, and let's dive right in. It's great to be here with you guys. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. So I just wanted to start with uh, a simple yet difficult question. What is your definition of innovation? What is innovation uh, for you? It's, um, I guess for us, it's actually a really simple uh, definition, both of creativity and innovation. It's, you know, um, the production of the new, you know, a difference that makes a difference. Um, we, we like to have what is, I think, a seemingly simple definition of them so that we don't um, focus uh, we don't like start to bring in lots of assumptions right off the bat. So, you know, when you look up the definition in the dictionary, say of creativity or innovation, it, it talks about novel ideas. So it already assumes humans, 
it's focused on an individual, it's about an idea, but all of those, you know, that's all baggage. That's that we have to put aside to really think about these things better. So I think as a way to begin for us to step out of all of that, we try to keep it um, really simple and very abstract. Great. Um, and you you start your book uh, by um, crit well uh, criticizing is maybe a bit too strong a word, but you describe the problem with um, the historical approaches to design and innovation. You go by you go back quite far in the past. You talk uh, already about the Greeks. You may but maybe yeah. tell us a bit more about that and uh, what is what are the main criticisms of the usual frameworks. Sure. Uh, maybe I'll kick it off and Jason just jump in. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Western tradition in general has, uh, has never had a place for creativity outside of God's work. You know, and, and this comes out of Greek thinking that, you know, that something that's new and true and whatever it might be, has to start as um, a perfect version of itself. And so it, it has to pre-exist humans because we're changing and valuable. But when it comes into the kind of Western tradition through theology, you know, God um, ideates, you know, has a vision, and then he just makes it so, you know. And um, so the Western tradition never... You know, when it talked about things like inspiration, but that that meant literally seeing God's plan, you know, having an insight into what um, God wanted. So till the, you know, the word creativity and the focus on it um, only emerges in the 1800s and the early 20th century. But it replicates this model. So, you know, which is to say we we the standard model of both innovation and creativity is ideate, come up with an idea, figure out a plan to make it real and then carry it out. And you see, you know, if you kind of squint or look at almost every existing model of creativity and innovation, they follow that. You know, so design thinking is say a, um, a really good example where they just, they add um, empathize at the beginning, and then it's ideate, plan, and make, you know, ideate, prototype, and make. Um, the problem with that is if something's genuinely new, you can't begin by ideating because ideas, ideas um, rely on concepts and language and images and what have you which all um, are things that we already know. And if something's radically new, qualitatively different, we won't be able to begin by um, describing it, ideating it, um, articulating it in any way. Um, it, it's simply qualitatively outside of that. So the paradox is that, um, you know, if you think that creativity is something like ideate, plan, and make, you will never get something genuinely new. You will just get variations of what we already have. And yeah, and I think there's a great example of that um, with, um, if we go back to the 1800s and ask horse owners, you know, what would they like? you know, if we empathize with the problem of a horse owner, we're never going to get to a car. If we empathize with the horse owner, they're going to say they would like a stronger horse, a faster horse, a horse that's bigger, that eats less or shits less, right? But they're never going to ideate their way to a car. We're never going to hear through empathy that they'd like a car. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a limitation that we see you know, with current creativity models that Ian was just outlining with the ideate plan make. And, and, and from time to time, we're 
maybe labeled as hating design thinking, which uh, isn't really true. Um, we just believe that design thinking comes last or second, and that the first half of innovation, the disruptive, the qualitative uh, difference that Ian was just describing, needs to precede models like design thinking and that or, or other models that are rooted in ideate plan make to allow for disruption and genuine difference in novelty. So I guess some people would, would argue that, for example, in the, the design thinking process, so, okay, they, they add once, w- w- empathize on the front, but they, the, they also add another step, which is to understand customers' needs and, and define their, their problems. Is this also an issue in your view? Is this not I far think, enough? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the... It's part of the the same problem, which is to say, like once you, if you can understand and articulate it as a problem, you're already um, articulating the space of the answer. Like the two are connected. So I, to be disruptively innovative, you have to invent first invent the problem, um, you know, and the problem space, and so that's part of the what in a way needs to proceed you know like you know it's not like figure out the what the real problem is and then move to um, solving it Um, I think you have to step outside of that and imagine well um, you know we are actually in the business of inventing problems to be disruptively creative and that 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 inventing a problem you know, leads you to a whole other set of approaches. And, and to just get back to defining the needs and wants, Jonathan, that you had mentioned there, I think it, it also lives in the same space as design thinking that it comes, it comes after that disruptive innovation, right? It comes after the, um, the new and novel emerges uh, more organically than prescribing through problem solution approaches, right? And so it's, it's certainly critical that we uh, define needs and wants of end users, right? We need to commercialize. We need to bring, uh, bring novelty to the world that, that meets some desired confluence, right? Where profitability can, can, uh, can perform, right? Uh, but after, right? After the novelty. So, so that comes further down in the, in the process. We, we'll, we'll take some time uh, later on to describe more specifically, your approach. Um, I wanted to actually, to, of course, Jan, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I, can I just, I think what I would be really interested in uh, that, that you might expand a little bit more on it, because I think a lot mm-hmm. of it hinges on, on that word, is it that, and, and it's the word new. So I think rather the discussion is about what, what exactly is it that the new here, I think innovation is, is a separate debate, but I think a lot of what yeah, you're yeah. developing is, is what exactly you mean by new. I think that probably merits a bit more oh yeah elaborate that's a things. great question yeah so <clears throat> I I think this is where it's it's really important to see um, that the new um, you know difference you we can say that there's really two forms of it in general there's um, change in degree where it's it's the same thing but quantitatively, different, you know, more than, less than something. Um, And that's most of what we see as innovation and change around us. You know, we're, um, we're getting older, we're getting less hair, um, phones are getting faster, whatever it might be. It's change in degree. And it, it, it's world expanding, you know, it's making you know, the, the ecosystem of uh, the smartphone, bigger, you know, slightly different, varying it. Um, but there's an entirely different form of, of change or the new or difference, which is um, change in kind, where it's qualitatively different. Um, you know, so what, what applied quantitatively in one world, its criteria is um, simply 
you know, do not exist, don't matter, um, don't show up in another world. Um, so it's, you know, the apples and oranges thing. You know, so on one side, the new is about world making, novel world making, that's the qualitative side. And then the other side, it's about world expanding. They're obviously connected, you know, and, um, but I think this, once you see that there's a qualitative side to innovation, um, creativity, novelty difference, and that the qualitative side of, if it's genuinely qualitatively novel, it will not share any of those qualities with um, what came before it. There's something genuinely, there's a genuine rupture. Um, and it's not just a linear progress. And, you know, so we see qualitative change all around us in different ways at different scales. Um, you know, it, it it could be just in uh, materials, but it also could be like in how Jason was saying, um, it's qualitatively different to live in a world of um, transportation through living beings like horses and cows and what have you um, to one that's powered by machines, you know? So, um, but, you know, there's qualitative difference than that that's even bigger, like say at a cosmological scale where animists live in a diff entirely different mode of being alive than um, you and I might, you know, so there it's playing around, it's playing at different scales in different ways, but you can, once you start to re recognize it, you see that it's a fundamental feature of what we're talking about. Yeah. And can you tell us a bit about the, how we can cross over from quantitative to qualitative there, there's uh, there's a connection between the two and you explain this in in your writing i i think that yeah there's like a number the most you know the most useful way um so generally like to sorry the, go on yeah you, you you have this great example with the table um i don't know if you might wanted to start with that with that table example yeah, I think, you know, like scale is a really, you know, great thing where, you know, if you, um, if you made a table smaller, maybe you get a stool, if you make it narrower, you get a bench, if you make a table a little bigger and lower, it's a bed. And these are all changes in degree that keep it within the world of furniture, right? But if you made the table um, so much larger, you would have crossed into architecture, for example. So it's no longer um, furniture, but now it's like a, an outdoor shelter. Um, so there's, there's a way that just by simply um, going quantitatively, you will find the threshold of something where it changes qualitatively. Um, you know, some of those are really vague, like, when does a hill become a mountain? Um, but I think they're really useful things that people don't often notice when they're doing very um, straightforward form forms of change, like where you think it's all the same um, and you don't notice that you've, you've done something qualitative. Um, you know, and, and that's, I, I would say, like, one other part of our educational models is that re they really privilege, like, that it's universal. It's, there's sameness everywhere, rather than a focus on um, difference, making difference, understanding difference. I think there's so, a lot of, uh, sorry, go, go ahead, well, Jan. I think there is a lot of emphasis, I would, I mean, I think, in a sense, kind of the counter- position probably to what you're elaborating is people that are saying, well, innovation is the reassembly of existing stuff. So kind of yeah. you take different ideas that are already out there, you combine them in a new way and that, and that then is innovation, but it seems like you're in, you're kind of trying to go for a much more radical kind of cut with what exists. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, but it could be like, this is where I think it gets interesting. Um, 
where something can switch from one thing to another. And, you know, this is, you know, what's called in evolution exaptations, you know, where, you know, the famous example is that, um, you know, Darwin was asked, you know, to explain how a bird could come about because um, Mivart, you know, said, well, if it's incremental step by step, mm. how would you, how would a wing emerge? Because when you have half a wing, you'll just be eaten. So what's the use of half a wing? And Darwin realized like the answer is that um, the wing in whatever state it was had its own purpose, you know, so it, it, it wasn't about flight. Um, but flight was um, a repurposing of a wing that was already there for something else, you know, that, and that came about incrementally through um, co-optations, through switches. So, you know, where the wing, the feather first emerges for sequestering toxins that then becomes about um, th thermal regulation that then becomes about being sexy um, scary egg warming, whatever it might be through these kind of, but at each point it has a, a stable use. That's just wonderful. Um, but it's also haunted by the possibility of being entirely co-opted for something novel. Mm -hmm. Um, and most of those novelties kept it within its world, like land creature, like just the, you know, went to a warm land creature, to a sexy land creature, to a scary land creature. But there's at some point where enough of these unintended things come together. Um, and there's an exploration of possibility. You can fall out of a tree, you know, and um, parachuting and then gliding and then flying emerge. And then there's a different way of being. But the important thing I think in what you're saying of like where we find things and we mix them together in new ways is the radical version of that is we're taking things, we're ignoring their intended purpose or use and trying to see what other effects they might have. What else could you do with them? Um, so you're not, you don't have to start um, with something totally crazy and wacky. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and that's where I think it's interesting in what you're saying is like, we can start um, by, by either noticing, which is quite difficult, but um, some unintended capacity in something, or we can deliberately experiment with it in ways that would bring that out. Um, so I think that's an important part, like, while these things sound really um, like when you say there's no way to ideate the, the new people are like, Oh shit. Well now what we need some mystical weird process. But in fact, it turns out that we do these things all the time. Mm. Like, um, but it's more through serendipity and accident that we find the unintended, but you can develop methodologies you know, to work with um, exaptation in, in very sophisticated ways. Okay. So I think this notion of exaptation <clears throat> is really one of the core pillars of uh, your, your approach. It reminds me a lot of, uh, I don't know if you know this book by K Kenneth Stanley, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. Uh, have you heard of this, uh, this book? No, he's an, uh, an AI researcher, and he, he talks basically about how um, well about exaptation and, and how um, uh, how innovations are not a linear process and are not about yeah. optimizing towards a goal. I, I see yeah. many similarities with um, um, you guys are talking about. I wanted to also dive into, I, I really liked another story that you talk about in one of your posts, which is about traffic lights. Uh, I wondered <laughs> if uh, one of you could maybe just explain that story, because I, I think it's a really nice idea that illustrates this, this idea of acceptation. Yeah, I mean, this is the right spot for it, you know, um, because as um, Ian was just describing, you know, the, uh, the acceptations, what else can they do? 
right? The unintended possibilities. And so um, we have this uh, presentation that we'll do with either university students or workshops. And we'll put a uh, two pictures up on the screen side by side, an image of a uh, traditional holiday nutcracker. You'd crack walnuts or chestnuts with uh, alongside an image of an intersection with a car stopped at a uh, traffic light. And we'll ask the group, you know, are these two things the same? And invariably someone will say, yes, of course, they're both pixels or they're both images. And, you know, none of that matters. That's not what we're getting at, you know, but are, are they, are they the same? And generally speaking, the room will, uh, will, will say uh, they're not, uh, but yeah. some are, some are paying attention and realize it's a loaded question, right? And obviously they can't be, right? That's why we're asking it. But they're not entirely sure why they'd say um, they are, in fact, uh, the same. And, and ultimately, we show um, a picture of a crow um, after these two images. And, and, and the reason being that crows will sit on the, uh, the wires of the intersection, waiting for cars to come to stoplights and they will fly down and they'll drop a nut underneath the tire of the stopped vehicle and the light will they'll fly off the light will turn green the car will drive forward crack the nut the crow will swoop down pick up the nut and they're both the same because they're both nutcrackers but the important message here really and how it how it intersects directly with exaptation is the question of what else can it do, right? What else can anything do, right? To discover the unintended possibilities and potentials of qualitative difference because nothing, nothing comes to being for its intended purpose, right? Everything evolves out of an exaptation for some unintended purpose. And so we, we have, uh, the crow is, uh, you'll find it, pretty much on everything, you know, right. It's on the cover of our, of our um, website and, uh, and, and our materials. And, and it's kind of our, she's our little mascot to remind us and, and those that are hanging with our work, you know, to ask constantly of all that you're engaging with, what else can this do to kind of get to those unintended potentials and possibilities? I, th I think it's a lovely example. I, I, I find it, it just really, um, shows how how powerful this idea is um, of exaptation and maybe we can just you can tell us a bit okay so how can we actually exact things i mean how can we do this uh concretely we'll we'll get yeah. into your process in into your approach in detail later but maybe just a few ideas on on how can we do this yeah, this is, you know, like one of the really beautiful things is that, you know, exaptation at its at its simplest is is really something quite easy to do. And that's just by <clears throat> um, blocking, you know, if you if you figure out what is the purpose, what is the intended purpose of something and you strictly refuse it. Um, you immediately enter into a, a terrain of what else can it do? Um, you know, and then I think you want to add um, a second rule to be good at blocking. And that is, you know, because we already do that type of co-opting in everyday life all the time, especially when we run into a hurdle or we're in a rush or something breaks, like you, um, you want to have, you head off to a party and you don't have a corkscrew, you know, so you figure out what else could I use to do it, but you're making um, one thing do the work of another existing thing. So it's really not novel. You're still interested in say opening bottles. So I think the second useful rule, um, and I think more like a guiding principle is always um, when you're thinking about what else can it do, you're trying to think of the things that it, it's doing that are less like what already exists. And you're always trying to bend to 
the odd, the, the unexpectedly non-existent. Uh, so it's an experimental process. And I think that's like, um, you know, in that title of the book you're sharing, why it can't be planned because it's a, a real exaptation in this kind of blocking where you're sort of putting a fence from going in one direction. You want to keep adding little fences as you notice yourself going back to what's been done to push you further into the new and that you'll start to co-evolve with it. But it's as simple as just saying uh, a type of refusal, like um, we won't sit in our chairs, no more sitting with chairs. They can do anything else. Um, and then you start to move into something. And, and how does this relate to this notion of affordance then, which is quite a well, well-known term, but no one really knows how to define how the, the feeling in design. Yeah. Well, there's like two branches of uh, um, defining affordance. And I think for us, you know, you could say affordance is a feature, you know, in the environment that you can use for something. Um, so it's out there, like it's a physical quality. But um, the Gibsons, when they came up with this term, you know, they were, they were really interested in understanding how um, humans in interaction with their environment um, come to see it and engage it um, for what can happen. So the affordance is neither in the thing nor in the person, but it's the relation. And I think that part's really important. Like um, the nut crackingness, the affordance of cracking nuts for the crow isn't in the car tire or in the traffic light. It's not in one thing, but it's the relationship affords it. And so what you're trying to do when you start to think about affordances is you're thinking about um, specific contextual relations you can make that will afford a certain outcome, a certain possibility. Does affordance mean, you, I'm, I still, this is, this is not a, a familiar term to me. Uh, does it mean usefulness? What does it, what does it mean? Uh, affordance, um, it's coming out of like, maybe to back up, you know, the, the classical, like um, hard science way of thinking of things is like, well, stuff is just stuff. It's like atoms. Mm -hmm. um, and so our, the world out there, there's a world out there that's, you know, stuff. And then we have an internal representation we make of it. Um, and that we interact with that internal representation. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Gibsons, um, their intuition was that that model of reality is entirely wrong because we, we, you know, if you think about your everyday experience, you're not interacting with representations. You're just doing things. You, you spontaneously, um, you know, grasp things and hold things. And so um, the idea of an affordance is to get at that in an intentional life, um, the, the, the possibility of things emerges through engagement. So it's neither like just atoms out there and representations in her head, but in the doing and the acting, things come to be what they are. So depending on, you know, the type of body you have, like, so if you were, I don't know, a whale or a, um, a tick, you would have, you would see a different, an experience, a different reality. Um, even though it's the same atoms, you know, and um, so it's trying to get at that. And I think that, opens up when you when you understand when you connect the idea of affordances and exaptation um, and co-opting you see um, how innovation can happen 
um, in radical ways without having to fall back on planning and ideation. Um, because what you're doing is shaping you as you're shaping it. You know, so you're engaging with, you know, the environment, it's pushing back on you, you're pushing back on it. It's affording you new possibilities because you've blocked one set of things um, and you're following those and you're stabilizing them. And so it's like the feather afforded the dinosaur the potential to be sexy, you know, and, and then it started to follow that which unintentionally afforded it the possibility of being something else. Um, so it gets you out of like purpose and utility and identity. And it's like, well, what will this afford you? What will this relationship afford you? That still seems like usefulness though. Like the feather all of a sudden is used for, is useful for all of a sudden you can have brighter plumage yeah. and the males can attract uh, predators away from the nest. And then, Presumably yeah. that makes them more attractive as mates. So, but it was yeah. the, the, the whatever, whatever, some non-flight bird, a peacock is what I'm searching for, you know, can't fly. Yeah. Maybe they can't, I have no idea. The, um, but anyway, so it's able to use that uh, ultimately to fly with. So that's, so if it still sounds like usefulness, what, what am I missing? I think if you think of usefulness as a relationship, that's not um, fixed. Um, and it's, it's kind of um, between something and both sides have agency in it, then we're talking about roughly the same thing. I think, so like, I but if the, you, yeah, I use the feathers think, to attract a, I use a feather to protect my uh, little birds, my little baby birds. Then I use my feathers to fly. Then I can maybe use them for combat or for uh, to swim or, 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 whatever other things there's one one definition of affordance that i read somewhere i don't remember exactly but i thought was quite nice which is that it's a, an an invitation to act yes uh, I, I thought that was quite a nice definition and uh, it, it's i think the difference i would make with usefulness is that not all actions are necessarily useful but you can still act on things i can still um you know uh I can grasp things, but I can grasp some things, but I can't grasp other things. I can, and and the, to your point, Ian, you were making before, which I think is also really an, an interesting and powerful point, the idea that every, that it's a relationship between the, 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 the agent and the object that, that will define what affordance is. And you, you also give yeah. a nice example for, of a chair, for example, that you know, might be seen differently, obviously for a human than for a, uh, an insect. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, they, and, I, and, and so I think affordance is really, it's a, more, it's, it's a much more kind of functional thing than, than usefulness. It's, it's about being able to act on something but that doesn't yeah. mean that the acting itself is in any way um, purposeful when you're doing it. It's just that, okay, I can press here. I can, I can do this. I can, yeah. that's how I understand it. affords, it. you know, the traditional Gibson said, you know, potential action. Um, yeah. What's really important. It's, it's, mm -hmm. and I, and I think this also gets back to where we started with this idea of ideation and having ideas. Um, is that, you know, to be a human is to be part of an environment, you know, where the, in, you and the environment are co-shaping each other. So even when we talk about thinking, that the thinking is coming out of the doing and the acting and the engaging with an environment. So if you want to think differently, you know, you have to do things differently. And I think that's like another, I would say, like, founding, um, not assumption, but like a part of the approach is that, that things, everything comes from the middle, you know, so it, it always involves doing experimentally. So think, thinking isn't something that happens in the brain. Thinking happens, you know, in an embodied way with an environment, with tools. And if you want to, think differently you know that's where the blocking comes in 
block habits, block practices, change environments, change tools, um, refuse certain things, um, you know, and then always kind of um, safeguard against falling back into the, into the old, you know, so that you don't have to know what's going to emerge or what you'll do. You just want to be, in a sense, cognizant of what not to do that you can push into these kind of novel affordances and stabilize them. Blocking sounds like introducing constraints where it I introduce does. a constraint and now I have yep. to act, I have to pretend like whatever, I can't sit on this chair or yeah. something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are like um, enabling constraints because they, they open up an unknown field of possibility, you know, through their, their, through something very negative. Well, something I, that, sorry, so, something sorry, that really makes on. sense about that is it, do, it does make sense. Is like there's um, there's but there's habits, patterns. There's like we're gonna we're gonna either choose the easiest thing to do or the thing that's just been grooved by repetition. It could be a relationship between yeah. those two, and we're gonna that's never that's there's nothing that's gonna break that unless there's some intention, some intentional like. You know, that's why I like weight loss things like um, intermittent fasting, for example. So there's a I introduce this constraint. I'm not going to eat between this time and this time. And that forces a I'm just trying to understand, make sure I understand yeah. it forces different behavior. Is that a way to think about it? Yeah. Or it opens up the the possibility for potential new actions, you know, that but rather than starting by prescribing the action or the outcome or the goal you start by saying what you're not doing. But, you know, I think at the level, Scott, you're saying where it, it can't just be at the level of ideas, but it has to be at the level of practices. Like, uh, and I think this is a big part that happens in a lot of organizations around innovation is they want, they want you to think different or have a different mindset. Um, which might be okay, but if you don't change the environmental conditions, the ecosystem, both like the physical one and the, the types of practices and habits, um, nothing will change, right? And so I think the focus has to always be um, much more holistic and ecosystemic, you know, which is also like, let's get out of the obsession with ideas in the head and what's inside and look at how things emerge from action and environments. I really like this. I mean, this is bringing the loose to innovation kind of thing. Sounds like it at least. Yeah. Enough, so that is a hint to anyone. But <laughs> So I, I mean, um, what I, what I really appreciate about this is this, this kind of conscious way of, of breaking with the old habits and, and how, how you can do that. But, in a sense, there is also, I mean, how can you bring this to then, then in a sense of a, of, 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 of a project or a client or a question or, I mean, this is very, very open. So how in the end kind of you, you, you get, get, get a product out of it? I mean, that may be a stupid question, but, but how, what's the relationship here or how can I? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think, you know, so there's those things are on one hand context sensitive like you know but there's some general like things you can say um, about how do you bring something out that's new you know so the one thing um, that's really important to start with is to um, you need to disclose like the underlying logic that you're in um, mm. and and you need at the same time as you're disclosing that you need to abstract out of it like you you need to have a way of understanding the that space much more abstractly um, so we were just talking with a colleague about um, you know coming back say to the furniture example like the chair you could Think of the chair much more abstractly as um, a tool um, to support the body in repose. Um, you know, so it's it's not 
you don't, when you say something at that level of abstraction, you don't have an image or an idea of what would solve it or resolve it. Yeah. Um, and then you can see what are the underlying, um, you can disclose the underlying logics that you've used to approach that space before that equal things like chairness or stoolness or whatever it might be. But chair and is you can, just one way. I mean, it's then one yeah. possible solution to the problem of supporting a body. Or, or it... yeah, and I think the thinking of it as an area of concern. And then if you realize like the chair, when you disclose, I think you have to get to like an, almost like an ontological level, like that, you know, like a chair um, assumes um, or supports a set of ways of thinking about life and being alive, you know, so that um, it, it promotes a type of um, human individualism in its kind of discreteness. It, it, it kind of replaces the body. Um, you know, it's an, it's a second skeleton. So it's like the body becomes less important. And it allows like the, the head, the mind and the eyes to take over, you know, so you start to see those patterns. And so then you can also block those like, and say, well, we don't want um, a tool for disembodied conversation, you know, or whatever it might be. And then that, then you can start to um, find unintended possibilities in thinking and following um, and developing a, a type of um, feedback loop that rewards um, difference um, and, you know, disrewards um, falling back or stops you from falling back. And at some point like that feedback loop, a, po a set of positive feedback loops that are allowing for the autonomy of whatever that emergent difference is, hmm. it's making you and it's making it and it's making a world at the same time. And I think as it grows and co-emerges, um, you're pulling in more and more um, people, you know, resources, things, and you start to see how it um, has an outward focus. Um, you know, and, and in some way, like we like to call that like a feed forward relationship. And that's what I think, um, you know, what Jason was saying at the beginning where you could at that point see um, the type of questions design thinking at its best asks, right? Mm -hmm. But you've already co-emerged. Um, so, you know, like now you can, you can understand what is, what questions does that qualitatively different world ask? What problems does it want us to pursue? what modes of being alive um, emerge, you know, and, and those are like the concerns you would say are of a customer or something. So uh, this actually allows me to bounce back on, on a, a thread that it's such a wonderful discussion. So many open threads, I'm trying to keep track. So I don't forget to get back <laughs> to different things. So I can jump in now with one of the threads um, which connects back actually to your your definition of um, of innovation, and you you say in one of your articles actually that you don't really distinguish creativity and innovation, and so your definition, as we we heard previously, is uh, that uh, creativity involves the emergence of novelty. And I had a question immediately when I read this, which is ah, but isn't there uh, is, it, is newness enough as a definition? Where, where is the value part in, in that definition? And I think it's, it's related to um, what you were just saying, because, I mean, this exaptive process is an evolutionary one. I, we find the same in, in nature. And so a related question to the value question is, who is doing the selecting in this, in this process? What is the... What is the environment that's that's exercising the evolutionary pressure on on this novelty such that it, it generates value? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I would say is like value is always there, and um, value is a quality of being alive. 
um, like things have a value in the most minimal sense, like, um, but that novel values are emerging. Like they're not, um, you don't need to predetermine them. Like as you do something differently, qualitatively differently, you are kind of um, nurturing qualitatively different values. Um, but, but the, you know, so I think when you say who's doing it, maybe the other thing to say first is there's no inherent positive value to being novel. You know, it's, it might not be the right approach to something. Um, the right answer um, might be to just do what we did five minutes ago. You know, it might be to go back to what we did in the 1400s. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, so novelty, you know, creativity, I think we give it a lot of um, uh, positive value. Like it's the greatest thing of all things. It's, it's, one, um, it's one aspect of being alive. And it's one, you know, really critical tool. And I think, you know, we need to see it in that lens. Um, so we can't be kind of in a kind of neo-capitalist model where it's like, screw the old, you know, new, 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 better, better, better. Um, <clears throat> that would be a false way to think about it. But I think for a lot of the kind of questions we need to answer today, we do need to do things um, radically differently, um, you know. And, and so th that's the other part I think of framing that question. Th then, you know, when you're in a value situation like that, where you're like, "Well, let's experiment with the new because it's important in a given context," you're suspend. I think you have to suspend. Um, value judgments because you you will be judging it the new with the values of the old so there's a part where you have to actually allow the new to emerge by part of what you're blocking is um, a deep set of values like an, a way of being alive um, and which is really difficult but the new isn't going to emerge if you um, prejudge it, you know, and, and this is like another Deleuzean thing, Jan, like where, you know, Deleuze um, takes from Nietzsche and says, you know, to be done with the judgment of God, I just say to be done with like a final overarching judgment, but uh, allow the criteria of judgment to emerge from what you're doing is critical to the new. So, but it could turn out to be a disaster. <laughs> so what I'm getting from, from you here, if I understood correctly, is that not, uh, not all value necessarily has to come from new things or creative things. But my question, I think, was a bit the other way around, is, uh, is uh, do all creative things need to have value or not? And who decides on this value? Because this is this was kind of the thing, I mean, and you talked about it. I mean, we can do new things, but they can be totally random and be pointless. I mean, I can decide to start going down my stairs on my hands if I want, you know. I mean, <laughs> is, is that really, you know, something I want to do? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pause because we want to see it. We want to see that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be fantastic. Uh, too but bad I, it's a I, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, the part I'd say there is, that's why I wanted to say at the beginning that value's always there. Like I think what we mean when we say something's pointless is, is either that um, from our current value structure, and I mean it like a deep kind of general horizon, um, we don't see its value. Um, you know, a novelty will always appear as pointless. 
like disruptive, qualitatively different novelty because it doesn't it doesn't fit in the criteria we're looking at it. And I think that's part of the profound difficulty of um, even noticing difference is because since since life already has like a valence of, of value to it, um, that you look at things and you're like, that's stupid, that's pointless, that's pathetic, that's uninteresting. You might not even notice it or you notice it as, you know, you can think of like the dinosaur exaptive example. You, you can't see that it's a wing for flight. You just see that that's a fucking sexy wing. And you're like, damn, that's a beautiful way to be a bird. Um, but the value of difference um, is in everything at all times. But it's, it's only, um, it's not, it's a virtual value. It has no... Um, it has no content to it till um, some experiment takes hold of it and, and um, makes it actually, uh, since it has no content, it's not like you're actualizing it, but you're making a new value, a genuinely new one. Quite, quite interesting discussion. You know, as I tell you, the question that occurs to me though, if I'm, I'll just make up a scenario. Let's say I'm a product manager for a, or a, a leader. It could be anything within yeah. a manufacturer of tents, say tents for backpacking. And I'm listening to this discussion and I'm asking myself, well, how do I use this thinking for my next generation of tents? What would, what would you guys say? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, or does it, or does it apply to that type of application? It totally applies. I love Absolutely. tents too. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> so I, you know, I think that the, uh, this idea of, you know, where is the value and how do we, who chooses, right? Where does it come, you know, where does it emerge? And that is in that latter half of uh, innovation, you know, development that we were talking about earlier, right? Um, Ian's describing this requirement that there must be some skepticism that we must hold as the new is emerging because we can't apply the, the old value judgments to it, right? Uh, and then, Jan, you know, you you asked, or excuse me, uh, Jonathan, you asked, uh, you know, who's doing the selecting, right? Who's who's choosing and determining whether there's value in that? Well, when you've when you have uncovered something that has some unintended potential that's radically new and different, right? At that point, then, right, and you've determined that it's something worth following, something worth experimenting with, something worth trying to bring to the world right then that's where you start to get into more of those design thinking empathizing right um jobs to be done uh, models of innovation to to bring them to bear right and then to determine if that value is there for the tenth scott right and so if we've just if we have some skeptical new approach to tenting right it's through then now we, we kind of emerge out through some new, uh, you know, empathizing, co-emerging, co-developing with end users, meeting wants and needs, right? And determining if that value then is something worth as a product manager of tents, should we develop this or not, right? But Jason, it's, you could go back further. Like, sure. I think, like if you put the whole process together, Scott. Like, so if you think like, if you look at all the world of tents out there and you disclose like, what are the underlying patterns and logics? Um, how do they work? <clears throat> um, and just say, let's block these main approaches, but think of what's the general matter of concern that tentness participates in, you know, and then to start to, experiment with that with what you've blocked and i think you would find unintended possibilities that you'd follow and you'd come up with a new approach to um you know dwelling in the outdoors whatever it might be um, and that approach then would give you a framework that then you could think of like what are the the new product um niches 
and the types of things. And then you could think strategically, which of those is, um, you know, would have the, is most doable and have the biggest impact now, you know, which one should we experiment with? And then you can follow like uh, the logic Jason's saying. But I think that the important thing is the, you know, the methodology might sound counterintuitive, but it's, it's very doable. Um, and you see, you often see businesses doing things like this, but they misunderstand or misrecognize what they're doing. Um, you know, or you see it in small areas. Like if you look at tents, there's all sorts of exaptations, you know, the materials like now are coming from materials designed for sailing, which were byproducts of materials designed for something else. Um, you know, on and on. But so you can, I think the first thing you notice when you look deeply at, for example, product innovation is it's almost always exaptive. It's, there's some set of co-options going on at many levels in it, you know, and it's how to take advantage of those at a deeper level, um, how to push them further. You know, so you could, in a way, take that whole process or you could take parts of it and, you know, and um, apply some, you know, blocking and exaptation to it. Like, could we block the pole? Could we block, um, you know, um, whatever it is, some component, and you would push yourself into these spaces in really interesting ways. I'm just curious. Are you guys familiar with the concept of functional analysis? Yeah. yeah. This uh, this reminds me a, a lot of that. It's uh, for folks that are listening that aren't familiar with it. It's very similar to jobs be done. Actually, you could even say it's the same as jobs be done, with different terminology. But you, you take an object and you looked at the function. You reminded me when you said the co-opting the pole. Uh, so for some people, there's a certain type of ultralight backpacking tent, and that's exactly what has happened. You look at what's the function? What's the function of a tent pole? Well, it's to hold the structure up, and then the question is: Well, if we took the pole away, what else could accomplish that function? And there's a whole new category of tents that are supported by. I think Ian is a backpacker, is what I'm going to guess. Based on if you yeah, we use tent. We use your trekking poles that you're walking with, anyways. So you can you've actually found a different uh, something to serve for that function, and you overall reduce. To wait anyway, but this con that concept of functional analysis, I find it be very useful and interesting, and not not many folks know it. But you're some of the just the things you describe. It just reminds me of that of that method a bit. Yeah, and that's like where you're um, using like exaptation within the same space. So you're keeping the boundary conditions. Like I want to make a tent, mm -hmm. but I'll block this component. Mm -hmm. um, but the overall, like, we're going to have some kind of material between you and the environment that, you know, houses you loosely, you know, and, and what things could we block? What, what explorations would that lead us to? And um, I think, you know, the really important thing for us is always to also, when you do those kind of things, to go back and think what, um, new mode of being alive does it open up? Like what new framework or paradigm? Because what often happens is you, you develop a product in this way, um, but you don't realize you've actually developed an entirely new approach to a field. Um, and, you know, you confuse your product in the field and then you lose out on the space you've invented. So this is like the, Thomas Edison, you know, where he invents um, essentially the world of media, but he thinks he invented a, a playback device, a record player, um, you know, and, and quickly, you know, within 10 years, he lost the entire business and, and he lost the industry in that space. Um, and so I think there's these, kind of important things you need to do when you go down that kind of product route and you're you're trying to um, just merely 
change some component of something. It's often you've actually um, made the threshold of like something much more radically different. And how do you not lose sight of that at the same time? So uh, I'm, I'm seeing two different ways of, of blocking that we've described through these examples. Uh, the first is uh, blocking a component uh, as the, the tent pole and say, okay, what else can we, could we use this for? Yeah. And, and the second one, and you alluded to this, is what this more fundamental blocking, I would say, of a different kind where you, you're blocking in the functional space or in the, uh, uh, as we discussed before, in the affordances space, you look and you say, okay, what, I'm not going to use this chair as a sitting uh, tool, but I'm going to, you know, what else can I use it for? And I'm going to yeah. try and see it. And, and the thing is, I mean, on this second one, I actually see enormous similarities and parallels with, uh, let's say, a jobs to be done approach kind of thing. And but the, obviously here I, I see kind of a, a, an, an issue or something I can't quite get my head around is a trade off. It seems to me there's some kind of trade off that's not easy to make, which is um, between basically scoping. OK, what is the scope of the of the of the project? What, what are we going to focus on? What's the functionality, even in a very abstract way, as you mentioned before, for instance, dwelling in nature or something like this? Yeah. We're already we're already setting boundaries on the project, and and this notion of exacting because when the dinosaurs uh, had their got their feathers, they were not thinking, oh, I'm going to try and you know build something in the sexiness space. Just to 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 take that example. So so where do you set this trade off? I mean, because that's that's the critical question. I mean, obviously you can be extremely narrow in that in the setting of that space, or you can be more broad. And and how do you decide that? And maybe they were trying to be sexier dinosaurs. I mean, who are we to say? We don't know. We can't rule that yeah. out. <laughs> I, I think the important part is is not just um, you know the framing of it, um, but where you're because I think you have to. It's to get any type of novelty whether it's radically disruptive or just a developmental, there's some type of framing at some scale. But the real question has to be um, the type of iteration that you're interested in. You know, so the dinosaur iteration is, is an exploratory open one. You know, so you're, you're seeing that um, sexiness is some, something, it becomes something and you develop it. But it's still um, haunted by other radical possibilities. And so I think when you manufacture a process like this, a lot of times we think of um, exaptation as just happening once. Like somehow somebody magically, um, you know, the radar to microwaves version, you know, like a chocolate bar melted in somebody's pocket and they had the idea for a microwave. But to see that your iterations are, are you want to go further. You want to leave, um, you want to leave the entire, um, let's just say, paradigm behind. Um, so you're, versus you're like happy with tent world and you just want to like iterate within tent world, a set of blockings. But I think the, to do the qualitative thing, you know, where you want to um, move outside of a of a fundamental paradigm, there there's a different type of multiple um, iteration cycles that you're doing because it's not going to happen in one go, um, and that that takes like a different set of constraints each time and exploration. Um, and even, you know, the disclosure, you probably won't understand what's really all happening, you know, with the first um, iteration. And so I think this is the part, you know, if you were to diagram it, you know, that there's this kind of complicated um, um, iterative movement, exploration, reframing with each time that makes it like a genuine um, co-emergence. 
So maybe this is a good time to talk about your more specifically your uh, your approach. Um, I did actually want to talk about problems a bit more deeply because uh, I know you wrote quite a bit on that. And yeah. um, I, I did get, that was the only thing I got a bit confused on, on what exactly is a, is a problem for you guys. Um, so let's, let's just do it. Let's just ask you, okay, what, what is a problem? And can we maybe just define that? Um, and, and I'll maybe just introduce it with a, a, a beautiful quote and we actually uh, interacted on LinkedIn around that quote because uh, and you I may have uh, mentioned it or I think you you talked about Bergson but you maybe didn't mention the quote so I'll just read it out yeah. it's um so it is a question of finding the problem even more than of solving it for a speculative problem is solved as soon as it is properly stated I thought that was a really fascinating quote. And so I wondered if you could maybe expand on that quote, tell us what it means for you, and then maybe just tell us what you understand by the term problem. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, uh, it's a great quote and it's an eccentric way to understand a problem. You know, so it's, I think normally we understand a problem um, in how it's literally specified, um, you know, like it can be put into words. But part of um, what Bergson, you know, and, and Deleuze, who's, you know, they're kind of tied together in this, thinking about it, these two philosophers, they're trying to get at is like behind any anything that can is articulated, there's a set of assumptions, implicit assumptions, there's an implicit um, framework and um, practices and habits and logics. And so the first thing to, like problems look more like um, environments. Than, so this is this notion of assemblage that you, you mentioned? Yeah, like an assemblage and a problem. You know, so like, um, you know, we're all of these, so there's like, physical components to a problem, there's habits and structures, there's implicit ideas, frameworks. And so once you see that these things are all there, um, you know, and I, there's a great illustration of that, you know, in the, the movie, The Great Train Robbery. I don't know if you ever saw this. It's a, not a great movie in any way, but at the end of it, um, the judge asks um, Sean Connery, who's like the robber, like, why did you rob the train? Um, and Sean Connery answers, well, because that's where the money was. <laughs> and, um, you know, and the judge was asking a question, like he was framing a problem where there's like an implicit background of, of morals and values and laws and regulations and ownership and all of those things, um, you know, but you normally don't notice those things. You, you know, we, we're so much part of a world, we take it for granted. So when somebody says a problem like hunger or whatever it might be, it's not, it's not, um, there, there's a lot to be unpacked. And, and that's what Bergson's, you know, the unpacking would show you that the, you could say the assemblage or the infrastructure of the problem was already shaping its answer. It's like field of potential answers. Some things count as answers and other things don't. Um, and, you know, so that's, you know, so inventing a problem is, is really what we've been talking about the whole time is like, how do you invent um, an infrastructure for a different way, qualitatively different way of something coming into being. Um, but a problem, a problem isn't um, understandable. If you say, you know, for example, what is hunger? Um, if you're coming from a different way of, being alive, 
you know, you wouldn't, that none of those terms would make sense to you. It's just that we share so many common things that we, we can ignore the assemblage part, the infrastructure, the implicit components. Um, but to be really innovative, you have to daylight all of that, disclose all of those, and then, and then realize that, um, you know, you can ask yourself the question then, do you want to play on that playing field of those possible ways of answering it? Um, and to be disruptively creative, you know, the answer is, has to be something like no. But I think most often we just think, well, that's a universal fixed problem. Um, let's just get to solving it. Um, and we don't notice that it's not. It's a, it's a constructed, you know, assemblage that has a space of answers built into it. But you, you make the point at some, uh, at some point in the book that uh, there's a misconception that problems are something to solve or to overcome. Yeah. And I mean, for me, that's exactly how, how I would, I mean, I think there are different types of problems. I mean, I think maths problems are not the same as uh, innovation problems. But if you ask me, uh, if someone wants to solve a problem in his life, it seems to me that you know, okay, you've got a, a goal and the, you, you can't reach that goal for because there are obstacles or various uh, constraints that can't be satisfied. I'm like, okay, I, I, I get that. Um, but you're saying it's not that. That's not your conception of a problem. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think of what Jason was mentioning earlier with the horse, if you ask somebody who's got a horse, you know, what your problems are, what, how can I help you? You know, they will say things from in that space of um, having an animal for transportation, you know, like I would like, um, I need to figure out a better way of feeding my horse or, you know, a better type of stable or, um, you know, whatever it might be. The manure, getting rid of the, the manure, manure the streets. Yeah. But, um, you know, and it's the same if I ask you now, like, what are your problems or what are you trying to overcome? Um, there's already a space of potential answers that you can explore and you could go into them. But that is not the limit of the possible, the potential. That's that's within the that framing. Um, but we just kind of assume like, that's all there is in a certain sense. Um, but from the perspective of innovation or, you know, creativity, that's all there is because of how um, we've organized a structure, a system of potentials. Um, you know, and, you know, when the car comes along, it's not like the horse problems disappear. They just simply become irrelevant. Right. Nobody solved the, um, the problem of how to feed the horse better or to deal with the horse shit. They were no longer um, relevant. And I think that's the important part is if you, you know, you we focus obsessively on solving problems like that. Like we got to deal with all this horse shit or feeding the horse. Um, it turns out maybe we don't, you know, um, if if we can um, reorganize the assemblage of things, um, entirely different problems will emerge um, and different questions and different values and possibilities. So starting with the assumption we've got to solve this uh, is like, is one thing you have to step back from and go in and say like, you know, why, why are we assuming that? Um, and, you know, I, I don't think we can answer it definitively, um, you know, as in like we should focus or we should be more disruptive. Um, but I think the experimental ethos here is like, is simply important to realize that no, you don't have to solve that problem. It's not like, it's not fixed. It's not objective. Um, the problem is part of um, 
that assemblage and that structure, change all of that, and those questions become no longer relevant. And, and this goes back again to the point on um, Kenneth Stanley's book on why greatness cannot be planned, this book I mentioned earlier, the this idea that multi-objective optimization actually can bring you further away from a from from the actual solution that will be the best for this this problem so if you optimize for less manure and people actually did this you know they they yeah. suggested adding um basically um what would you call them uh, uh, like bags, uh, you know, on the rear end of horses, so they, they, yeah. they didn't drop stuff. And and so, but in fact, if if you have a totally different solution, there's there's no none of these uh, undesired outcomes to take jobs to be done terminology would actually be um, be relevant in in this situation. Yeah, and um, yeah, so, so I think this is. I mean, this is something we we see. Quite, I mean, it's also, for example, the move very often when we digitalized things. So when we digitalized music, for example, a lot of the problems that went, I mean, now they're kind of coming back again because people are using discs again and all that stuff. But, but, but all these problems that have to do with the consumption of the actual or the use of the actual solution, they just disappeared. I mean, the quality of the sound or prevent scratching and all of these kind of things, they, they disappeared. Once you move to a more digital digital way, so for me, I think this, this, uh, coming from the jobs to be done perspective is this: the, the way I would phrase what, what you're putting an emphasis on is is first and form, foremost, forget about the solution. Like let's just for a moment refrain from a believing that the way the solution is is defined by just the product features, and b that it is exactly the, the product that we should be talking about in the first place. Now we can discuss what we should be talking about, but but this switch away from from Im just improving the solution that already is there is kind of the key key element for me. And there's yeah. another way of of kind of opening up the, a different kind of problem space if you so if you so want. Yeah, so yeah, and, th and that's like a another aspect of blocking, right? Let's block solution. We call it solution thinking, mm -hmm. but just you know that. Um, we're blocking either the entire question, you know, the problem, or we're, you know, blocking just that we should be focused on a solution. Getting to solutions gets right back to the ID8 plan make is, you know, from where we started, right? It's, it's, in, it's rooted in the known. Yeah. And so for the radically different, right, we need to step away from that yeah. and invent problems worth solving, right? Make the old ones irrelevant, like you said, Jonathan. Yeah. So I think this is a good time to just talk about your your approach. Um, you, I also want to mention that you make really uh, very nice illustrations uh, of your your text, which I I appreciate because usually I find illustrations annoying if I'm totally honest because I, I find they don't exploit the affordances of uh, of visual. Um, uh, communication uh, very well and, and often things could be better said with text but I find your illustrations really bring a enhance the, the your your writing and and clarify ideas in a way that writing probably couldn't so so I just wanted to mention the illustrations are very nice and um, could you maybe outline then in that case the the approach itself the different steps and etc yeah I mean, you know, this is where the illustration part really helps um, outline it. But, you know, if we go back, um, if we go back to this idea that there's two forms of change, change in degree and change in kind, um, you know, and change in degree is this kind of quantitative step-by-step -step, um, diversity iterative diversification of things, right? Um, you know, and then there's the qualitative, which is disruptive, which it's not going in the direction that you're already going. So we like to start by saying, um, whatever you're doing, um, you're engaged with something. You're always already engaged. So rather than 
talking about something like ideation as a beginning to, to um, see that the reality of whatever we're doing is we're deeply embedded in something we're prof- and we're doing, we're engaged. And that gets back to like the whole discussion of um, affordances and what have you. Um, but out of being engaged, you know, you can think of these kind of two questions, like given what you're engaged with, given the context, is it a matter of developing something um, or is it a matter of disrupting? Um, and obviously this is like an approach. It's, it's, it's not really a methodology in the sense of like hard steps that are fixed. I think, you know, we, we like to talk about it in these stable steps because it's much easier as a scaffold to learn. Um, but when you're doing it in reality, it's, it's much um, murkier. Um, or you're applying one set of practices and techniques and what have you. But there's a kind of decision you're making between um, are, are we interested in um, a qualitative change, a disruption, or are we interested in improvement? Um, you know, and if you're in one will take you down what we call um, emerge, you know, which is this kind of idea of co-emergence, like you're, you're, you're improving something, you're co-developing with it into reality. Um, if you're trying to, if the interest is in being disruptive, we say that the next um, sort of space you enter is disclosing, where you're um, disclosing the underlying logic, the general matter of concern, unintended potentials in a space. Um, and that's leading you to block something and start to follow something else. Um, you know, so it's, and then we say the next step is um, to deviate um, because you've blocked something and you're following the unintended. And the important thing is that the, the goal of deviation and, you know, and the, is, is not, this is back to our last discussion, isn't to come up with a better solution to a problem, but to actually um, allow the, a world, to, a novel world to start to emerge, a novel approach, a novel practice. Um, and that brings you back into that um, emerge phase that we talked about at the beginning is like, now how do you make that um, real? How do you co-emerge with that? world and that will lead into you know what you could call like the space of of products and services and actions and outcomes that are um, no longer um, um, experimental so it's not a double diamond but it's the double loop uh, that you yeah you know and like we like to think you know if that the emerge loops back into the the deviation side, it really emer- it it's always connected at any point because like a change in degree could become a change in kind at some threshold. I think the other part that's really important is like if you make, if you just make something new, most of the time you don't really pay attention. Is it also affording like a qualitatively different opportunity? Like, you know, um, and that was the Edison example. Um, so you can also loop back um, where you're not trying to deviate, but you've, you've made something and you're trying to understand what's the world that is really emerging with it if we let it. Um, you know, and this is that thing um, I think Whitehead says, like, we always make the new do the work of the old. Um you know, but what's, what is the new really trying to do? So like when material, when music goes digital, we're still, we can still think of it as the way we used to, but, um, but what, where could it really go? What, um, what new world opens up with digital music that isn't that old world? And that part, I think of world making, is really important because we're generating the new all the time. 
but then we just turn it back into the old, you know, and then it, um, it's still emergence, you know, um, but we're losing it. And I think that's a really important part. Yeah, so to, to summarize, you have four different um, yep. s- stages, so I don't know how you call them. Engage, in, in, engage yeah. disclose, deviate, and emerge. And, emerge. and they're, yeah. they're and, looping. And exactly, two loops, and uh, you, the, the, the loop basically where they where they the both loops where both loops connect is basically where you have a choice of going into either uh more of a developmental approach uh, which is change in degree or yeah. um a more disruptive uh, approach which would be change in kind and yeah. obviously as we we discuss both of these are connected you also mentioned that there's no um, right place to start which i which i think is a very interesting i i really like that i have to say because i always wondered you hear a lot of people and including you actually say start with the problem and uh, somehow i i always feel yeah but many people actually start with just building something and uh, and then figure out the problem and 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 i always wondered if really i really like starting with the problem myself but i always wondered if if actually it's it it really is that true and my so so you don't actually if I understand you correctly, it's not necessary that the it's not sequential. There's not necessarily a first step, but you do say at some point that in um, so in uh, the first step in understanding the world, because part of your engage um, process is is to understand the world around you, and you say the first step in. Sorry, I'm getting mixed up. That's not what I want to say. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 first step in making new worlds which is uh disruptive innovation change in kind innovation the first step is to um understand the world and yeah. my my question is around that was how can you do this without having some kind of representation of what the the world is how can you do this in a in a in a an embedded or um a fourie cognition type of way yeah um i I think the i'm not sure if we're um, getting anything confused here but what we mean is understand the world you're in not like a new world but and obviously um i think understanding here is also in a really loose sense um you know where a lot of it um, is implicit. Um, you can't fully explicate it. Um, a lot of it's lived, um, experiential. You know, in, in complex things, understanding comes through like um, perturbating and probing and getting feedback from it. Um, but if you don't, if you don't have a sense of what it is at some level that you're in it's very hard to block things, you know? And so the, the blocking, um, and I think it's not just like the literal blocking, but understanding, um, so the, how to, you know, what's actually different and what do you want to keep alive? What difference you're trying to keep alive, but you don't know the world you're trying to make. Yeah. So, so somehow my question was, uh, sounded abstract, but it was in fact <laughs> maybe more more uh, concrete. Is um, you need to in order to to understand what you want to block, you need to have a representation of what the the problem space is. And I, I was wondering what your take was on on that. I mean, you, because jobs to be done, the strength of jobs to be done, which is something we're quite interested in, is in I believe mapping the. The, what we would call the problem space, and I, I, I kind of wonder how you can do this in a in an embodied non-analytical, non-reductionist way, which seems to be some of the, the you know the, the values you espouse. Yeah, uh, so I, I don't think there's any easy way to do it. Like as in like 
um, just do this and that'll come out. But, the, you know, it, it's, it's experimental. But, you know, for example, when we were talking about the chair and disclosing um, the logic of the chair and, and seeing that, you know, the chair isn't just like a tool, but it's, um, it both makes and supports, like, say, a, a mind-body way of being alive. Um, it has it has a set of um, um, abstract values that it participates in, and I think you know through um, drawing on your that four EA approach, like you're embodied and active, um, you can start to sense um, and articulate those values or affordances as things you could block. Um, you know, but th I think there'll be things that are general. Um, a lot of these things are mainly tacit, um, you know, but that's why I think it, it really has to be experimental. Like you're trying out in all of this. Um, you're not just brainstorming or theorizing, you know, the, the paradigm you're in or the framework, but it's like, what would happen if we tried something a little different here? What will that disclose about this logic? Um, so you're building up, I think. And this is why, you know, I was saying it's not so linear, cut and dry. Um, but the, in, you know, engaging and disclosing are already experimental practices of testing things out and building up that, not you know, knowledge and, and tacit you know tacit knowledge explicit knowledge embodied i think they um, include the problem space ian yeah mm. and um right you know so what we often try to do is we work with people and we'll do um really embodied workshops that abstractly like or like with an invented problem engage these so people can understand um, how you don't need to ideate or how, you know, what is blocking in a much, you know, in a, an experiential way and then take that into their actual context and start to figure out how could we develop similar experiments. Great. So I think we, we're getting to the end now of our discussion. I wanted, wanted to invite my colleague, Scott or Jan. Did you have any further questions or comments? We have good. I, I think it, what I really liked is the, is this, is there is really this strong intent to create, create something new. And I think it's also, I mean, we maybe give a little sneak peek. I mean, we pre-discussed this kind of before talking about it. And then I like how, how you kind of, consciously almost said okay let's start by by thinking about what innovation is today and then say no to these kind of uh, features so how can we so it's almost like you're already applying this this so i like this consciously consciously saying no to, to a couple of things in order to create something new so that was, was yeah. what i'm fascinated by so yeah yeah very much enjoyed the writing and you got you guys were, i think we're similar at least we imagine ourselves fancy ourselves to be deep thinkers in the topic <laughs> and if Maybe not that. At the very least, we're contrarians at times, and so that can be a kind of a fun place to be. <laughs> yeah, I think you know, like um, for us, it comes out of like years of like experimenting with these things in different fields and realizing, um, you know, where we've been brought in to say do something closer to design thinking, and realizing that that's just never going to work, um, you know, or like. Um, you know, and, and I think through those experiences, you know, connecting with um, our, you know, more conceptual or philosophical interests, but it's always been practical. Like, let's, if we're really talking about innovation, like you're saying, Jan, like doing something different, like let's hold ourselves to that task. And um, if these assumptions and methodologies aren't doing it, then let's, you know, let's be contrarians. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, I thought 
this was a really fantastic discussion and I, I really want to thank both of you, Jason Frasca and Ian Kerr for, for coming on, on the show and being so generous with uh, the information. And I, I can only recommend that everyone uh, subscribe to your newsletter, which they can find on your website, emergentfutureslab.com. And uh, I also want to recommend the book, of course, uh, Innovating Emergent Futures. Uh, there's a lot in there, which also goes into the really nitty gritty of the practice. So we didn't have that much time to get into that. But for, for listeners, I mean, there's, it's a 300 page book. You can find all sorts of information. I also recommend that very much. Um, what can where can listeners find out more about you that I may have not uh, mentioned? Uh, where can they they contact you? Yeah, I, th I think you know we we um, we work through these challenging questions, and thank you all for you know for challenging us today, right? And and, uh, and digging in deeply into the concepts. Uh, you know, I think a lot of our fleshing out concepts happens we do it you know in public you know um on linkedin on a daily basis we're both posting daily uh we're both evolving our thinking uh, our work our our model both with those that contribute in the community to the conversation and then um it, you can you can see that organically evolve in our newsletters and, and the work that we're doing there so um on a daily basis if you wish to engage with us it'd be on linkedin uh and then um our website, you know, newsletter would be the uh, next best thing. We're happy to talk with people, work with people. We love um, collaborating, taking on things. Yeah, I can corroborate that. I've been following you on LinkedIn and you answer everyone's questions. You're very active and there's a lot of very interesting discussions also in the comments. So I definitely yeah. recommend people go and, and, and follow you on, on LinkedIn. Um, I I wondered if, uh, apart from your uh, book, Innovating Emergent Futures, did you have any other books that might inspired you? What are your kind of, like the, the books you've offered to people or that you recommend most? What would be your suggestions? <laughs> there's like, the problem is there's like yeah. thousands. I, <laughs> I, I, I would I can say... imagine. The, the one general thing I'd say is people um, people in the space of like management or organizations or even products, they read too many books in those spaces. Um, you know, for exaptation, go, go to books on evolution for, um, you know, looking at emergence or, you know, affordance, go back to the sources. There's, those are the great books and that they'll also, I think going back to sources inspires you to come up with your own approaches. And, you know, in philosophy, like the work of Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze um, is really great. I was great. just going to say, you have to sneak in philosophy. Here. I mean, <laughs> this is kind of philosopher's duty. To... <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, you know, like, I think people... People think there's very little practical stuff when you go to like evolutionary biology for, yeah. I don't know, a product designer or um, thinking about a larger organization. But I'd, you know, rereading like the um, all of the various versions of exaptation from Stephen Jay Gould and um, Elizabeth Verba and, you know, others all the way to um, philosophers and what have you, but don't stick to like everything I would say in the space of, of, of business and management writing is, is derivative, not necessarily in a bad way, but there's um, deep creative resources of where that's coming from. Fantastic. Um, Jason, you wanted to, comment or you you're going to go with the same same answer yeah well you know i think you could find examples as well right of exaptations uh, you know in you know uh, a number of books uh, the wright brothers is a great one uh, one that we love uh, the box uh by mark levinson's uh, you know really fascinating um story of uh, the container and how 
it emerged and evolved uh, through acceptation. Um, you know, um, I think, uh, you know, Ian, Ian alluded to it a, a number of times that noticing things is quite hard. Uh, noticing the unintended possibilities. There's a great book by um, Rob Walker, The Art of Noticing, um, is, uh, is, I think, one that, if nothing else, raises your awareness to possibilities in your space around you, right? Um, you know, uh, I could probably keep going, you know, with some <laughs> other books that challenge, you know, why are we trying to be radically disruptive? Why are we trying to be radically innovative is because, you know, humanity is facing a colossal crisis, right? And so getting into some of those books to really understand the challenges that we're facing so that we can disrupt beyond just widgets and things. Yeah. And on on that note, I think we will we will end. And I want to thank you again both for, for taking part in the podcast. And that concludes today's Product Quest podcast. Please send any comments or ideas for future shows to productquestpodcast at gmail.com. See you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's fantastic.